Welcome to Kaiser Watch with John Kaiser. I'm your host, Jim Goddard. John, welcome back to Kaiser Watch. Jim, pleasure to be back on the show. John, this weekend you'll be in Vancouver for the Metals Investor Forum, which runs September 9th through 10th. You call the five companies in your session Emerging Discoveries. What does that mean, and why is that the topic of your presentation? Jim, last week uh, your final question was, what sort of juniors are you going to be focused on after Labor Day? And much of uh, last week's uh, discussion was focused on this problem of inflation being persistent, not being temporary as a result of supply chain issues uh, emerging from an imbalance between COVID-restricted production capacity and a sudden post-COVID rebound in consumer demand. And uh, if we are going to repeat something similar to what we witnessed in that 78 to 1982 period, we are just at the beginning of a series of inflation uh, or interest rate hikes designed to subdue inflation. Now, we should get the inflation results shortly. And uh, the um, uh, back in uh, 1980, when Paul Volcker, he was dealing with 14% inflation. And it had arisen as a result of the OPEC uh, supply squeeze. And uh, it ended up becoming part of a wage price spiral as workers insisted on cost of living adjustments. And it became part of the expectation. So it was very difficult to kill. But he pushed interest rates all the way up to 20% and created a a deep recession in 1981 to 82 that collapsed real estate prices. And it was a fairly, fairly miserable period. The markets right now are, and at least the metal markets are anticipating something similar. And we, we have seen metal prices retreat and the prices of producers to a much bigger degree then we have seen other asset classes retreat. Uh, And that's because the uh, metal producers, uh, they recognize that if this really gets out of control in terms of interest rate hikes, inflation may persist anyways. And this will eventually sap demand for raw materials in a big way. So the, the metal markets are anticipating the worst case scenario outcome. And they have reason to be pessimistic in this regard. More and more in the mainstream media, we're starting to see, hear about how companies which have their operations, uh, production capacity based in China, are realizing that the game is over. There's at least three things, assumptions, that are no longer correct. China is no longer the an, an efficient place to get things done for export to the rest of all of the world. And that's because of the zero zero COVID policy, which Xi Jinping has made a symbol of the superiority of autocracy over democracy. And the Omicron virus and its subvariants, uh, it is so contagious, they're going to be dealing with this forever. So this problem's not going away. The second problem is that this huge Chinese market that all the foreign companies are after, it's fading out of reach because China tilts the regulations in favor of domestic companies un- which operate under Beijing's thumb. And now the biggest concern that is worrying companies is that China and the United States, the two biggest economies in the world, may end up in a hot conflict over Taiwan. And that means uh, having your production capacity based in China is a bad thing. So there is a lot of talk now of, of reshoring back the United States with a lot of automation or shifting to some of the smaller uh, Asian countries uh, that presumably will be out of China's reach. And all of this will require CapEx spending and will result in higher OPEX, which means that the cost of everything as we uh, embrace this uh, premium for stability and security of supply is going to go up. And during the transition, if things really all go to hell, and of course, with Russia's invasion of, of Ukraine, uh, it's, it's now clear Putin's in it for the end game. He's not going to ship any natural gas to Europe. He is going to induce a recession in Europe. And so all these uh, high energy costs, they're not 
going to go away in the short term. So the metal markets are expecting that no matter what Powell does, we will see persistent inflation, and he will probably overdo the interest rate hikes, possibly trigger a real estate price collapse. That ends up being deflationary for everything, and that's not really good for gold until they realize what they've done and start quantitative easing again to turn the situation around. So in this type of climate, the glass is half empty for resource juniors, in particular ones with advanced projects where you need to worry about what the price of copper or gold is, if, gold, if these metal prices are going sideways or retreated or possibly may trend lower. Uh, you don't really want to put money into those plays. And as for those which uh, are, uh, uh, you know, generating drill targets in your tra traditional prospect generator types, both the farm out types and those that uh, generate prospects internally and then, then eventually drill them to try and achieve a discovery. In this type of glass half empty market, it's very difficult to raise money and you do not get any anticipation speculation as the drill program uh, unfolds. You will get in this type of market if there is a barn burner hole, a major discovery hole where you can see there's significant size and grade potential, then you will see the capital flood into those particular particular stories and the, the, the speculators, they won't care about what the metal price trends are doing. They won't care what the macroeconomic uh, situation is doing because it's all about how big and rich will this discovery become? Now, in this type of market climate, uh, companies, well, in, in any type of climate, companies usually do not deliver a barn burner discovery. Well, those are extremely rare. Usually, they come close to something. They, they deliver results that are initially encouraging, and then it can be quite interesting. And it is only in this type of market uh, where w w that you can really look for emerging discoveries. And yes, you end up paying a little bit more. You watch the ones that are drilling targets. You don't really own, want to buy them because uh, you can't, you don't want to own them all. Uh, and you'll probably end up picking, picking the wrong ones. It's better to watch the quality companies like a hawk and pay close attention to results for evidence of an emerging discovery that says, okay, this is the right geological geological context. Uh, uh, we can see what they need to do next. We understand the timeline for what they need to do next to prove that this is indeed something very significant emerging. And and this is what these five companies that I've uh, uh, invited to the Metals Investor Forum uh, conference uh, this, this weekend, this is what these ones are all about. And the key is the S-curve. Now, S-curve is the market action, and it's also called the Lasson curve, that's triggered when the market starts to realize this is a real discovery, a major discovery. And its peculiar nature is that the peak value achieved during S-curve speculation usually ends up representing the implied value of what the project ends up being worth at the end of the day, years later, when it's ready, all the feasibility demonstration has been done, and and it and it's ready to to to, to be funded to go into production. Once the resource and the reason it can do this is because until you know the limits of the discovery, the sky literally is the, is the limit. Once you start running out of ore and you start seeing the geometry of the deposit and the approximate grade and then the res maiden resource estimates delivered. Then you shift into the feasibility demonstration. That's where the S-curve goes down, and you end up actually uh, at, at a lower level during that long slog where you have to spend lots of money. Market doesn't curve. For me, the favorite part in my career following resource juniors has always been the emerging discovery area. And, and most of the time, you, you miss the one like, a, say, an Aurelian that comes along and, and yeah, maybe you catch it at three bucks, uh, but that's up already five times from the 60 cents where it started. But then it goes to uh, 30, 40 dollars e eventually. And that's sort of the whole S-curve activity in action. But I, I really like this particular setting and it reminds me of uh, 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 January 2016. And that's when 
I had flagged Arizona mining as a bottom fish and then uh, upgraded it to a, to, to a favorite. Uh, uh, Bob Wares had a, uh, uh, mentioned to me who was involved with Arizona mining in, in, in 2015, which really was the bottom of this, this, this 10 year bear market that we had. It, it was absolutely dreadful. I'd seen the Arizona mining report these, uh, sulfide, uh, zinc, silver, lead results from the Hermosa Taylor project in, in Arizona, but didn't really pay that much attention until Bob Wares explained to me the geological causes. He said, these are in the sulfides at the base of the open pit that they had designed to mine the oxide resources on which they'd spent 40 million bucks. And by the time we ended up with the metal prices of 2015, that project, that open pit project with the oxides was a bust, but they ended up chasing it deeper and it, they discovered the, the, the Hermosa Taylor deposit and two, two years later, Cell 32 bought the company at about 620 for a 2.3 billion dollar valuation. And you could see this emerging discovery there right in front of you. You could do the analysis and I in fact did that and, and flagged it for, for my, uh, uh subscribers and, and covered it right, right to the finish. Um, right now, um, the only metal that doesn't have that sort of negative pall hanging over it is lithium. And last week I also talked about lithium mania, which was the topic of my presentation at the uh, June Toronto Metals Investor Forum. Uh, the lithium mania 2.0 that I talk about, that's also going to be an emerging discovery type story. None of the five companies in my session are, are lithium. I did that on purpose. Uh, last week I talked about Patriot Battery Metal, where they started drilling all these uh, pegmatite bodies in their Corvette project, and they've achieved a you know, $500 million plus uh, valuation very quickly. This is S-curve action. Uh, last year, if you were paying close attention to that, you would have seen the emerging discovery in the context of, of, of a lithium carbonate price that's gone to, uh, to you know, the third $30 range. And the other one was such a small market before the whole EV concept it started to become reality. Uh, the, the lithium market was supplied either by uh, brines from the lithium triangle or by giant deposits such as green bushes, uh, pegmatite deposits such as green bushes in, in Australia. But now we have a situation where the, the EV sector realizes that uh, there's no way they can switch to EV cars by 2035 unless we get a five to tenfold increase in lithium supply by then. And Eastern Canada is the place where you're going to see the other half of that uh, tenfold expansion come into existence by somewhere between 2027 and 2030 based on all these deposits that are being discovered. Now, lithium carbonate prices are still way up there. They actually need to come down. So even when they come down, that's not a bad thing because it just makes it more likely that the EV replacement of the ice fleet will become reality. But for uh, this session, I'm focusing only on the uh, companies where you can see evidence of an emerging discovery. They, in some cases, they've actually managed to go down in the last few months as fallout from the all, all the, all the uh, uh, you know, negativity about the upcoming recession. And a few of them, they've gone up uh, up in price, but none of them are really reflecting the potential. And all of them are in the midst of uh, programs that could turn them to the next stage of a confirmed major discovery. John, Arctic Star Exploration is a diamond junior with a property De Beers explored decades ago. Why do you think Diagrass is an emerging diamond discovery? I added uh, Arctic Star Exploration to my bottom fish collection uh, only about a month or so ago after assessing the results that the company was achieving on the Diagrass project, which they had picked up, I think, around 2014. Now, this block is very interesting because it sits to the north of the Diavik project uh, area that Aber and Rio Tinto, well, Aber discovered with Rio Tinto, and it's northeast of the Ikadi, Ikadi Diamond, Diamond project. And the beers had been in that area in the 90s, it had done indicator mineral sampling. Uh, it somehow had managed to not find the ICADI 
source of uh, all those indicator minerals. That was up to uh, Chuck Fitke and Stu Blossom with the help of BHP to accomplish. And when the uh, news started coming out about that there were diamondiferous uh, bodies that actually had macro macro grade to them, this was in November 1991, De Beers staked this chunk of land, and it proceeded to explore it quite rapidly. They ended up uh, by... That by 2002, they had found uh, several dozen kimberlite bodies. They turned out to be relatively small, half hectare to, to three and a half hectare, but apparently not with the kind of uh, size distribution curves that indicate an interesting macro grade. So the beers effectively gave up, even though their indicator mineral sampling of that property area revealed trains which did not have, and it's trains that had the G10 Hearts Brigade Garnet uh, indication of, uh, of diamond potential. But by 2004, they had given up on the area. Uh, they used, uh, you know, the whatever geophysics, magnetic geophysics at the time to generate these magnetic targets and, and test them all. They auctioned it to Magisker Resources, which at the time was run by Andre Odette and Jacques Latendre. It was a tough deal. It, uh, they had to spend $10 million bucks to earn 100%, but there were various stages where the beers could claw back up to 70% by simply reimbursing a couple times what they had spent. And they went and uh, you know, finally did the caustic fusion on several pipes that the beers had not even bothered to, uh, to, to, to assess. Uh, but they didn't really find much more in the, the, the jack pine Kimberlite, which by then we had the uh, square mesh system that had been developed as a way to measure micro diamonds and which can be used to project macro grade. And that sh did, was not very promising. The jack pine appeared to be the most diamond difference, but there was another one called Finlay on which uh, De Beers uh, drilled at least seven or so holes, more than on any other, but never revealed what that was all about. And that they let those claims lapse in around 2015. An Arctic star got in there, got helped out by Margaret Lake Diamonds, which helped put up some of the money to, to keep these uh, uh, claims in good standing. And then eventually Arctic star started spending more money on this project. And their idea is that of a rethink of this area. Now, it's already had the first pass where the obvious geophysical targets have been drilled by the beers. And, and there's been nothing really found that that's particularly interesting. So the idea that there's going to be a very large kimberlite, rich and overlooked there, that could be a standalone operation, that's very unlikely for the Diagrams project. However, both ICADI and Diavec are depleting mines with existing infrastructure that eventually, or actually pretty fairly soon, will end up uh, representing significant reclamation liability. And then, of course, there's a Northwest Territories government desire to keep the diamond mines operating. So if somebody can find a deposit that can feed the mill for five to ten more years uh, simply by trucking it, uh, uh, that would make everybody very happy, and that would represent an exit strategy for Arctic Star, which now owns 81.5%, while the partner Margaret Diamond has 18.5%. So last year they started a drilling campaign. They found five new kimberlites. One of them, Sequoia, seems to have fairly decent uh, uh, size footprint. They haven't disclosed enough information for us to really quantify uh, uh, what, what its tonnage potential might be. But what was really interesting about it was that the micro diamond size distribution curve suggests a potential macro grade in the 20 to 50, 60 CPHT carats per, per 100 tons type of grade. Now, that's relatively low for, for that part of the world. However, if you can get high-value diamonds, then, then, then you might be able to have a rock value that's worth open pit mining and trucking to the mill and recovering diamonds, especially if the diamonds turn out to be high-value. And one of the things that's emerged in the last decade is a much deeper understanding of type 2A diamonds, which are super deep diamonds that are, that are found, uh, that form 500 to 600 kilometers beneath the Earth's surface and is formed from material that used to be 
ocean floor basalt that got subducted, underplating the craton, actually ending up deeper than the multi-billion-year-old old diamonds, the peridotitic diamonds, which tend to dominate the uh, uh, Lac de Gras, uh, kimberlite diamonds uh, that have been mined by Diavik and Ikati. And these can be very large stones, like the ones Inkara has found at Karol, the Kulinan diamonds. And they're very unusual in that they have irregular shapes, which are not caused by resorption, and they are flawless. They have no nitrogen, absolutely zero nitrogen, not even like uh, uh, you know close to the detection limit. Uh, and, and, and they typically are flawless and very valuable. And the Northwest Territory, the Slate Craton, has been somewhat disappointing in that it has not coughed up any anything that truly qualifies as a type 2A diamond. But there's always the potential that such a subpopulation uh, somehow managed to become part of the other diamond population. And people like Chuck Dipke have been collecting uh, uh, information or chemistry trying to figure out the magic code of what possible indicator minerals might be present in a kimberlite that suggests that there's a super deep component to this uh, to, to the kimberlite magma that could indicate the presence of these uh, type 2a diamonds so this year they drilled uh, six or seven more holes across this body. They are still awaiting the, the, the caustic uh, fusion results. Uh, uh, SRC has been slow getting them. They thought they would have them in, in, in mid-August. And what we want to see is we want to see confirmation that they didn't just drill into a lucky phase of this system where there might be a decent macro grade, but when you step along the strike of it, uh, uh, you get lower grade phases. And, and the DO27 was a sort of notorious for that, that there was a portion of it that was a, a later phase that was completely barren, and that ended up being bulk sampled by the underground program, which gave an unnecessarily negative portrait of what the DO27 kimberlite, kimberlite was all about. That's, but also as part of this season, they, they drilled what may be a lobe of the Findlay pipe fin, that, that the beers had, you know, spent the most effort on but never revealed anything. And they got some uh, good-looking uh, visual uh, uh, indicator minerals in the core, and they call this the Arbutus pipe. And this may be an indicator of what that pipe is all about. So this this is they are seeing stuff that the beer first exploration wave. Back then, the beers needed to find a standalone discovery. But now we have a situation where... You just need to find something that can be developed and shipped to either Ikati or Diavik. They are using uh, more sophisticated geophysical techniques. Uh, they're also using a, a different uh, sort of understanding of the geometry of these uh, kindlelights uh, before they were just believed to be these uh, uh, you know, typical carrot-shaped uh, uh, eruptions, and in, in the case of Hardy Lake, uh, the work done by Barbara Scott Smith indicated that this had actually imploded into a uh, exploded into a, 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 a sedimentary platform based on what had fallen back into the pipes. Uh, uh, but but now they're recognizing that some of these are weird weird geometries, uh, perhaps similar to what we're seeing with the much older Gaucho Quay pipes. Uh, that mountain province and the beers develop, where you can have a, a sort of an elongated structure with multiple pulse nodes in it, and, and some of them might be better than others. So there's two dimensions to this uh, rethink of the old Hardy Lake project. One is using a, a, a new geophysical techniques to tease out targets that might represent the better chemistry for which a, a source was never found by the beers, but also to assess the potential for these large diamonds, um, maybe type 2A, but maybe simply another class of large diamonds that is present in these, and that would drag up the value, and it's not going to be a $2 billion home run like the caddy was for, a, for, for a diamond, but since we're starting with considerably lower valuations, getting a 5 to 10 bagger out of this type of emerging discovery, that is the reason I'm focused on that. And the whole diamond sector, it's kind of at the end of a 40-year, 40 30-year uh, 40, life, life cycle. Uh, uh, there's very few juniors still active in diamonds. 
and uh, the natural diamond uh, supply is depleting. Uh, synthetic diamonds have emerged as a competitive threat, but uh, the, there's a significant distinction emerging between the pricing of synthetic diamonds, of which an infinite amount could, uh, you know, eventually produce, and natural diamonds, which there's going to be a finite number of these ancient diamonds that are mined from natural sources. And with technology that allows you to track where they came from, you can preserve the origin of the diamonds as, and make it truly a collectible. So Arctic Star is going to be part of this session. There's still a uh, maybe several weeks away from having the results that confirm what the Arbutus discovery is all about and, and show us uh, if Sequoia is indeed a candidate to go to bulk sampling. But it's it's a revival of something that was tremendous uh, 30 years ago. And that also, that whole Lac de Gras diamond uh, discovery play, that also emerged in the middle of a... Uh, uh, a bear market, 1991, 92, is not a particularly good time. It really took almost a year for everybody to understand the implications. You could stare at the concho, the bigger picture context, take your positions, and then in 1993, the discoveries and the validation by Dynet and BHP itself all started to come in, and then it went into truly S-curve uh, type territory. It's not the same context because the whole area has been you know, heavily explored, but we might get a mini version with regard to the Diagrass project. Can Alaska uranium has been working in the Athabasca Basin for decades. Why do you think West MacArthur is an emerging uranium discovery? Can Alaska uranium, which now has Corey Bellick, ex chemical as a CEO, and President Peter Gasler, who has been with these companies uh, these, these past two decades since it uh, refocused from Alaska to Athabasca uranium exploration, uh, they have assembled a great portfolio of projects in the Athabasca Basin, which is famous for these uranium deposits, uh, often occurring at the unconformity between the sandstone that has filled the basin over time and the underlying older basement rocks. And it comes in two forms. Uh, there's the Eagle Point uh, uh, style, uh, which uh, the, the um, arrow discovery of, 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 of Next Gen is an example, where it's almost uh, basically almost like a vein that exists within the basement rock, has considerable vertical extent. And then there's the MacArthur River type deposit, relatively small, only several million tons, but <laughs> a staggering 16. 16% uranium uranium oxide uh, 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 grade. And everybody hopes to find another MacArthur. MacArthur itself does not have huge life left. Uh, chemical suspended mining of it when the uranium prices were, were lower than the cost of production at, at MacArthur River. And uh, the Can Alaska, with its uh, West MacArthur project, it's deeper in the basin, so the unconformity, it's down to about 800 meter depth. And projecting onto their project is what's called the C10 corridor, structural corridor. It, it, it's, it starts on uh, um, ground owned by Chemical, where it has the Fox Lake deposit. That's about 8%, eight, eight percent, uh, several hundred thousand tons uh, sort of perched above the unconformity. That's the sort of third third type where it actually sits above the unconformity within within the sand the sandstone and uh, and they had spent a lot of money on the 42 zone chemical was a partner spent five million has now been diluted back to uh, I think uh, um, 23 percent or so uh, by, by not participating but what was different about this discovery which makes an emerging discovery is they raised a lot of money last year and they went in there funding this 100%. Uh, they did a geophysical survey early in the year. And again, this is something similar to what the Arctic Star is doing in the Diagrass area. You do more modern geophysics with better crunching techniques. And they were able to see that the South C10 conductor was not quite where they thought it was. And, you know, I, I asked them, I looked at the map, and they had several holes that were drilled um, you know, seven, eight years ago into this conductor, and they came up with nothing. 
And the explanation was that when they saw the, uh, uh, ge the new geophysical results, they realized that they were uh, offset by about 100 meters. And with these types of uranium deposits, uh, unless you smack it right into where the unconformity is, where it tends to be sort of a pie-shaped uh, type of deposit, uh, uh, if, if you're off 100 meters, you may not get anything. And in, in July, they reported this intersection. They originally described it at 6 meters. When they finally got the assays back, it was 9.4 9.4 meters of 2.4 uh, percent, uh, with spikes with a spike as high as 6 percent in it. It looks like a minimum eagle point style discovery. It's 100 meters beneath the uh, unconformity. Uh, the, the rigs that they're using right now, they've got two rigs going to try and wedge around it. They're not the ideal kind for doing this sort of focused drilling. So they're basically using, while they have this equipment available, to drill a whole bunch of holes around it to um, map out the, uh, the geological structural architecture of this so that when they go back in there in, in the first quarter of next year with a directional drill, and, you know, they're looking at this, you know, 800 to 900 meter depth uh, type target, they'll be able to uh, uh, track where this high grade zone, and, and when it's a uh, Running 2.4 percent, that's you know at the 51 dollar price that uranium's crept up to. That that's almost three thousand, three thousand dollar, three thousand dollar rock. So this is this is like, like a um, a very high grade gold discovery. You don't need to build a huge number of of, of tons. And the company is well financed to continue. Uh, it does not need to raise more money at this stage to to take this further. And the, the stock nearly doubled in the wake of this, this results. Uh, I mean, from the visual descriptions, it was clear this was significant, which is why I jumped on it. Uh, and then when the results came out a couple of weeks ago, uh, the market really didn't really care because it's got this overhanging fear of this recession coming that's going to tank the global economy and metal prices are going to, going to be poor. And so again, this, I invited this company to show the audience here is what an emerging discovery, and if it ends up being a, uh, a multi-billion dollar MacArthur River scale discovery, uh, that's a lot of upside potential for Can Alaska from current level. Copper Lake Resources is exploring a polymetallic project which majors and juniors have explored since the 60s. Why do you think Marshall Lake is an emerging zinc, copper, silver discovery? Now, Copper Lake uh, has been working on this project for, for more than a decade. It itself has had other juniors working on it. Various majors had it. Uh, evidence of VMS style mineralization was first observed in the 50s. Uh, drilling sort of got serious in the 60s. And the first resource estimate, the Billiton Zone, uh, came out in, in the early 70s. And it's only 2.2 million tons. Uh, it's near surface, but the grades aren't quite what you want. It's not like the, the, the Sturgeon River complex in the, in the Wabi Gon domain, you know, several hundred kilometers to the southwest where five deposits were found that ended up uh, feeding a, a central facility. So this property has been a tease for juniors uh, long after the majors gave up. It's seen a lot of drill holes uh, down to 200, maybe sometimes 300 meters. The geophysics historically has never penetrated more than 200 and 300 meters. They, they hoped for extensions of the billeton. They hoped for repetitions of billeton. Uh, nothing was ever found. And in 2021, uh, Terry McDonald recruited uh, Don Hoy, who's an expert in these VMS type systems, to do a sort of a, a rethink of this project. Like, uh, where can we still look? And he digitally compiled everything, put it all together, assessed it all, and said, you know, if you're going to find anything interesting here, you're going to have to go deeper. So they commissioned a, uh, a deep IP survey in the vicinity of the Billiton deposit and came up with a very substantial 800 meter long, 300 meter wide, uh, uh, and, and who knows how deep IP chargeability anomaly uh, at depth, well below any of the past drilling depth and offset to the southeast of the Billiton deposit. So this year they drilled two holes into this, 
And uh, they hoped that they would be spearing a whale, but they didn't spear a whale. One hole basically hit nothing, uh, and the other hole hit higher up, hit some very high-grade copper, zinc, silver mineralization, higher grade than and with than they over several intervals than they had seen in the Billiton deposit itself. But the key was one of the holes, two of the holes, uh, a shallower one and, and, the, and, and the second deep one, they were able to drop a EM probe down the hole and look around. Now, it can only look around for, you know, 100 meters or so, but they saw that there were off-hole intense conductors and Don Hoy insists that pyrotite, the, uh, the usual culprit for, for, for causing these, uh, these, these off-hole anomalies, is not really present in this system. And so they believe that they're dealing with a smaller but still rich and significant and bigger than the, um, than, than, than the, than the Billiton, uh, uh, system. So, so they did, this summer they did a large EM loop survey over a much broader area and it confirmed, yes indeed, there is this 600 meter long, 300 meter wide, uh, going at least 300 meter depth, deep, conductive center um, that these two deep holes that they drilled managed to just miss. And they, when the ground is frozen, they realize it's actually quite swampy in that area where they need to position drills to drill that. So they will, as soon as it's frozen in, in November, maybe early December, they will put a, a rig on there and start putting holes into the deep conductors. And the geological context, you know, they put together a cartoon showing that the, the, the billiton itself might be a peripheral part of a tilted VMS system and that uh, where these very conductive portions are, that's where they might find a high-grade polymetallic system that will be too deep to be open pit mined, but at the kinds of grades that they're getting, that wouldn't matter. It would be a, an, an underground mineable situation. And you can see all this geological context in the stock, you know, was trading well earlier in the year, but again, it's been caught in the downdraft with all the negativity about this looming recession that's going to destroy the global economy. And so now the stock's sort of in the six to six to eight cent level, and you can buy as much as you want. Uh, and and, and, uh, and they're doing a financing to make sure they have enough to get this program done. And again, this qualifies as an emerging discovery where they could be one drill hole away from getting the high-grade barn burner intersection that says, yes, this conductive area is mineralized, not just with pyrite or something else, uh, some, some iron sulfide. It actually has the metals like copper in it that create the conductivity. Endurance Gold is exploring a gold property, a junior run by a dowser explored for decades. Why do you think Reliance is an emerging gold discovery? Endurance Gold's uh, CEO, Robert Boyd, uh, uh, auctioned this project in late 2019. Uh, he had looked at it when he was an exploration of EP for lac minerals uh, decades ago when Charlie Boitard uh, was exploring it. It seemed intriguing, but it didn't seem like it was going to be workable to have any sort of deal with uh, Nanika Mining, which had the property at the time. It was a very interesting high-grade gold results, and uh, Nanika spent several decades poking away at it and never really approached it in a systematic manner. And in 2020, Endurance Gold began a program where some say, well, it's moving so slowly. It involved drilling shallow RC holes, uh, doing these uh, biogenic surveys where they clip uh, needles from fir trees and assay them for arsenic. And, and they were able to show that this uh, 1.2, I think it's now 1.5 kilometer long corridor, a few hundred meter wide corridor between the, the Royal Shear and the Treasure Shear, it is very much confirmed by the fact that it is extremely altered. Uh, this was clearly a gateway for a lot of fluid flow, and they began drilling with the uh, core holes last year, and initially they had a series of shallow dipping zones, uh, the eagle zones, and these are running, uh, you know, they run five to Five to 30 gram per ton gold over widths of, you know, 10, 10, 10 to 15 meters sometime. But the problem with their orientation was, well, they daylighted at one end 
and in the direction they projected, they were going to run into the, uh, the southwestern uh, or northwestern uh, 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 shear fault, which is younger rocks that have been thrust up against this area. But they had the breakthrough with hole 020 last year, which was a deeper, what they now call the south feeder structure. And this year, they, with the core drilling, they've released 10, 10 holes of uh, 24 holes uh, uh, drilled so far. They're continuing to drill. And these have demonstrated that there are parallel sub-vertical feeder zones that are very enriched in gold. So they're finally starting to see a, a, a geometrical model for what controls the mineralization. And the surprise that's emerged is that there are the parallel quartz veins, which themselves are barren, but they themselves have created a pathway where the brecciated material on the sides has soaked up the gold, which typically is associated with uh, with arsenic. And uh, they are now starting to delineate this system. They've got holes pending where they marched back in the uh, sort of north, north, northwest uh, direction uh, towards the imperial zone. They've got holes pending there. They're happy about the visuals that they're seeing. The drill has now been moved uphill because they have to... Uh, push this road up the hill, wind it up, and they can only really drill from the from the, the roadside to hit this target. So they're gonna ho they hope to extend this thing another two hundred meters in the southeast direction. And this is a year round project. You can drill all year. It's not a seasonal thing like the Yukon or the Golden Triangle where it shuts down for seven seven months because of altitude and, and snow. And they also did an important option. They optioned the Olympic project to the northeast. And on the on the north side of the, of the Carpenter Reservoir, uh, small mines there, which suggests that maybe there are parallel structures of what they've got in the Royal Treasure um, Shear Corridor. So they're also doing uh, the biogenic sampling on that hillside, which has seen very little 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 uh, exploration it's all wooded there's also this nasty ash cover from a quite recent uh, uh, volcanic eruption that uh, obscures the bedrock but that the, 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 the fir trees roots managed to pick up the arsenic from the bedrock and it shows up as distinct patterns uh, where this this mineralization John, VR Resources is exploring an intrusive complex that was visible as a magnetic anomaly in the James Bay lowlands decades ago. Why do you think Hecla Kilmer is an emerging rare earth discovery? The uh, Hecla Kilmer project covers a, I think, four or five kilometer wide circular alkaline complex that's associated with this uh, Capus casing structural zone that uh, sutures uh, a couple domains together. And this region of the James Bay lowlands in, in northern Ontario, it has a number of these um, types of intrusives. One of them, the uh, James Bay uh, Niobium project, is, is a potential uh, mine, but it's hung up uh, with uh, anti-mining politics uh, in, in Moosonee. But this one's much farther south, uh, close to... Uh, the rail infrastructure there and, and a power power station. And, and Michael Gunning, uh, he was originally interested in the Roanoke project, which is farther north. It's also a similar intrusive complex. And his focus had been for the hydrothermal breccia potential of these intrusive complexes to host IOCG system, iron oxide copper gold systems, of which the Olympic Dam is, is, is the big world world class example. And he, the, the Roanoke hadn't really delivered anything, but he ended up picking up Hecla Kilmer and whatever copper gold mineralization they in, intersected. It wasn't, uh, really quite yet adding up. And these, these are like zones within zones. These are complex systems. So sometimes it can take a while to find something that is, uh, coherent and can constitute a mineable ore body. But this year they started getting intersections of higher grade rare earths than they had in the prior year. And this, when I saw this, it was a breakthrough. They were getting up to 2% intervals in carbon, carbonatite zones within this Hecla Kilmer complex. And when I saw those grades, especially one that was, I think it was a 65 meter, meter interval of 1.5% total rare earths, uh, 
and and then they were talking about like uh, from 0.15 to to 0.3.4 percent niobium also in it. Uh, I became curious and I asked, uh, well, what does the breakdown of these rare of, of the rare earths look like? And traditionally, you have big big uh, uh, and rich uh, carbonatites like uh, Mountain Pass in California and uh, Bayanoba in China, which is, you know, hundreds of millions of tons, uh, 3 to 4 percent. These typically have 98 to 99 percent uh, light rare earths. And that's great for the uh, neodymium and praseodymium where all the value resides these days. These are the magnet metals that uh, are needed to uh, make the electric vehicle dream a reality, most of which still comes from China. And it's, it's a problem that everybody's got their head in the sand about right now. Oddly, the rare earth prices uh, since peaking in the first quarter of this year have come down quite a bit because of slowdowns within China, thanks to its uh, supply chain issues linked to the zero COVID, COVID policy. So I asked uh, Mike, uh, well, what does the breakdown look? And, and when he looked at it closer and showed it and I plotted it up, I was able to see, uh, wow, 8 to 10% of this particular carbonatite is heavy rare earths. And then when I applied the current prices for all the rare earths to it, I saw that the, the neodymium and, and proseodymium, which are the light rare earths used for magnets, uh, they represented 69% of the rock value, which was over $500 a ton at the time. And the terbium and dysprosium were 21%. So these four magnet metals represented 90% of the in situ value. Now, Rare earth projects are 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 are, are, are complex uh, stories because you also need to sort out the mineralogy. Uh, it may prove to be the case that the the heavy rare earths are in some sort of silicate that's uh, very difficult to crack and recover from. But at this stage, we don't know. All that we know is that this is present. It's a large system. Uh, it, it looks like it uh, is close to surface, so it's open pitable. Um, the, the, the overall system is huge, so you only need to find a high-grade zone within this to have yourself uh, a rare earth mine that produces the magnet magnet metals, uh, both heavy and light. And in the case of light rare earths, there's plenty of deposits around the world that could be developed, uh, but they have a problem getting developed because China has the ability to lower the price uh, arbitrarily. And that uh, makes everybody uh, worried uh, that okay, as soon as we get this into production, the price will collapse and uh, and and then and then we'll be bankrupt. But with this, uh, one of the side effects of this geopolitical rupture that's emerging, where you have the autocracies of the world joining forces, China, Russia, and whatever ends up being their allies, uh, and the economy potentially splitting, uh, if we're we can get plenty of lithium outside of China. China has its own lithium supply problem. And China also has a depleting heavy rare earth supply problem because it comes from these uh, 0.05 to 0.1 percent uh, ion absorption clay clay deposits. Uh, but uh, we need to develop these rare earth deposits that have these uh, uh, heavy rare earths. And if we end up uh, having a economic embargo with China and don't get other rare earths like uh, cerium and lanthanum, those are so cheap right now, it's almost makes more sense to throw them away than to bother recovering them. But they also do have uses. So we're at a special window where all these end users are starting to worry, okay, we have all these dreams of replacing uh, ice cars with electric vehicles, uh, but we haven't really thought through where the raw materials are coming from in a non-globalized context. Everything has always been premised on the idea that China would become just like us and globalized trade would, uh, you know, send the, the lowest cost materials to whomever is willing to pay the most for them and everything would work out wonderful. But that assumption is now on the rocks and uh, it's forcing people to look at these projects. And so even though this, the grade is, say, not comparable to a Mount Weld, the uh, significant, uh, heavy rare earth component, uh, the location, uh, uh, it, it, it's not in the really swampy part of the James Bay lowland, it's where it starts getting 
higher higher level, so uh, you, you wouldn't be in, in, in like uh, uh, dealing with with endless uh, Martian and wetlands. And it's very close to transportation infrastructure, which is different from places like uh, the Strange Lake Deposit, uh, which is uh, way up there in Labrador, Quebec, in the middle middle of nowhere. And it may prove that even the niobium credit ends up being payable. Payable. The stock didn't really respond to this news. I've invited them to the Metals Investor Forum because I see this as an interesting uh, rare earth discovery that has achieved through the latest results, the sort of grades that you need to see the uh, you know, $300 plus per ton rock value that you need to support the cracking costs for these rare earth deposits. Uh, and uh, the, the stock is cheap, hasn't moved, and uh, I also believe this will be a discovery story that as they get more holes into it and start showing how the zones hang together and start doing some metallurgical work to figure out what the mineralogy and the cracking cracking flow sheet's going to be, this could also become a very significant discovery, especially if we do experience this rupture between the two biggest economies in the world, China and the United States, where all these raw materials like rare earths that come from China can no longer be guaranteed to come from China. John, thank you so much for the update. You're welcome, Jim. We've been speaking with John Kaiser. I'm Jim Goddard. Comments made on Kaiser Watch are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as a recommendation to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Archived online at kaiserresearch.com.